From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. Here's what's ahead. Over once again from the IGP Institute here at K-State, Guy Allen will talk about the latest USDA world grain supply and demand numbers and the implications for international grain trade. He specifically highlights what's going on with wheat. We'll also hear today from K-State's Nat Bascom. He's with the Feed the Future Innovation Laboratory for collaborative research on sorghum and millet. He'll fill us in on that lab's research efforts in developing food-grade sorghum and millet lines for consumption in other parts of the world and how information generated there also benefits growers here in the U.S. And awaiting with another stop, look, and listen, K-State's Gus Vanderhoven. It's all here on this Agriculture Today. Welcome once more to another Agriculture Today. Every month we have the guest now come in and share his observations and notes on the USDA's monthly grain supply and demand report. He is Guy Allen, senior economist with the IGP Institute here at Kansas State University, and he has some great introspect on what's happening with those trades, basing a lot of this on what's been said in this report. And this time around broadly uneventful, with the exception, perhaps, Guy, you say, of wheat. If there's a story to be had in this report, the wheat numbers would be it. Yeah, look, uh, following up from those USDA numbers, the uh, corn and coarse grains particularly, as well as the oil seeds, were a bit of a non-event on the day. Uh, The numbers coming out for the wheat situation were a bit bearish. We've seen the market sort of turn around since then and, and and rally back a bit. But I think that just highlights some volatility we're going to see. And I think today we need to sort of drill down into uh, particularly the wheat situation and have a bit closer look at that. So what are the fundamentals that stand out to you on that international wheat front? Well, from a world production situation, we saw the USDA increase global production by about 2.6 million metric tons to uh, just under 778 million metric tons, with a few changes in that. We saw total supplies uh, increase as well, with increase of beginning stocks for both Australia and the EU, giving us total supplies for this current marketing year of just over uh, 1 billion 67 million metric tons. So we've got ample supplies of wheat, although we're tightening things up a bit. I think the key dynamic country at the moment is Australia. Being fairly familiar with Australia, we're sort of coming down to the last part of harvest there. Uh, USDA raised their production to uh, 34 million metric tons, which is a a record crop. That's on the back of their local uh, ABEAR forecast increasing their production to those sort of levels. And we were sort of relying here on Australia to produce particularly the protein wheats as uh, drought and the short crop in Canada sort of waned there. However, we've had some very inclement weather through the harvest period, particularly through the higher protein growing areas in eastern Australia across uh, central northern New South Wales and into Queensland which we've seen quite a bit of downgrading to wheat. I think the the volume is there, but the quality, uh, the volume of the quality is uh, going to be a bit disappointing. That said, it, it is a record volume crop, so they're sorting that out. A lot of that downgraded wheat, I think, will stay in the domestic market. Australia has a wheat-based feed grains uh, ration there for the domestic market. But last week we, we heard rumor and speculation that China may have bought a couple boatloads of lower-grade Australia wheat to work into their markets where we're seeing you know, good, strong, strong demand. World wheat consumption, though, remains pretty good, does it not, Guy? Yeah, we've seen quite good strength in world consumption. Uh, we have USDA raised that number by nearly 2 million metric tons to just under 790 million metric tons. And a bit surprising, they raised the feed and residual number on that a bit. Even though we're pricing wheat out of the feed grains in the corn market, uh, we are still seeing reasonably good demand there. Again, part of that was on the back of uh, the downgraded Australia crop, as well as the tightness of total feed grains that we're seeing in China and also into Russia. 
Yeah. Russia, though, we always like to talk of the Black Sea wheat situation. Anything of relevance there going on? Yeah, Black Sea uh, continues to be pretty interesting. Keep in mind, in the last few years, Russia and the Black Sea have been the largest uh, producers and exporters of, of wheat. But we continue to see Russia raise their export tax. Uh, that It's been on for uh, some time now, and it's it's been a steady upward curve as they try to uh, depress exports maintain uh, a lower domestic price. And uh, countries around the world and Russia particularly are seeing higher domestic prices for food, particularly driven by higher wheat prices and commodity prices across the board. So that's slowing down exports there a a bit and pushing those exports to other regions such as Europe, uh, Australia, and to the U.S. As per exports out of the U.S., though, really is as much as anything else about price, you say? Yeah, at the moment we're seeing U.S. uh, price itself out of quite a few of the wheat markets. Uh, We're sort of freight disadvantaged here because we have some of the longer routes to move that wheat along with Argentina. We've seen ocean freight actually rally back up in the last couple weeks. Again, uh, putting that comparative disadvantage for our exports. And we're seeing that in in the slowness of our wheat exports uh, year to date on this. Even though we're expecting uh, record world trade in wheat, the other regions are a lot more attractive from a price point of view. I guess the other way to look at that, when I think about markets in general, it's the export markets which sort of set the floor, and we're seeing U.S. domestic wheat prices at a premium to that in in most places around the U.S. So as the producer, we are seeing them receive a premium for our domestic wheat. Summing up the wheat situation then for the U.S., if exports don't pick up, Dramatically, it's not a dire circumstance for the market domestically, though? Well, well, old saying in the grain trade is short crops have long tails, and sort of looking at a relatively short crop in Canada, and they did increase uh, the Canadian situation a bit. Uh, I think that'll play out true towards the end of the year, and I think we could see, should see the markets gravitate towards that export parity price across the board, which should mean increased exports for the U.S. Uh, producer, but it'll also uh, mean uh, moderated prices, relatively speaking. Right. Which way do you want your market to swing? As yes. the producer is the question there. Uh, notes that you have on the coarse grains from this past WASD report. Well, coarse grains, as I said, uh, wasn't real exciting. Uh, U.S. numbers were pretty much left unchanged, and with the U.S. being the dominant coarse grains producer with corn, uh, not a lot of changes on that. But a few interesting things in some of the other markets. Grain sorghum is probably one of the more interesting ones, as a projected record. World trade of 12.4 million metric tons with China buying a record uh, 10.3 million metric tons of grain sorghum. Sorghum, uh, like some of the other commodities, have gotten off to a slow start this year. But it's it's good to see that optimism in the grain sorghum, which should keep a good premium there as we move through the rest of the the marketing year. Yeah, The U.S. is very much in the hunt for that business? Yes, the U.S. is basically the primary supplier of grain sorghum. We did see an increase in Australia estimate productions by about 300,000 tons. Australia never produces a lot of grain sorghum, and most of their sorghum does go to export, either to Japan or China. And I think we put that extra 300,000 tons of production from Australia right into China. I don't think that's going to compromise any U.S. exports there at all. Another good sign is we have seen a slightly higher uh, Mexico imports of sorghum this year. At least we're still on the menu, and it's good to see the uh, Mexican consumers continue to consider uh, U.S. sorghum into their needs. And you say, Guy, you're watching closely what's going on with oil seeds and not just soybeans here, but other oil seed types that are making their mark in the trade of late. Yeah, the um, oil seeds, it's sometimes uh, we forget here being a corn and soybean sort of area in here in the Midwest. There are uh, major other oil seeds out there such as canola slash rapeseed, as well as sunflowers. And we're seeing a significant increase in uh, both sunflower and, and canola production this year. While Canada did have a significant reduction in their uh, canola production, Australia, again, with their, their good producing weather this year, is having a record crop of about 5.5 million metric tons. 
And that's going to fill a lot of that export gap in the global trade situation for oil seeds. Similarly, with sunflowers, uh, both Russia and the Ukraine being the major producers of both of those commodities, we're seeing those work into those markets. With the higher price of oil seeds, uh, end users are considering all their alternatives. The big driver, again, of these oil seed markets is the oil component. And we need to keep in mind that both canola slash rapeseed as well as sunflowers are significantly higher oil than soybeans. Soybeans are about 19 percent oil, where canola generally ranges 40 to 44 percent oil. So uh, with the increased production in those types of oil seeds, they go uh, quite a way further to uh, help meet that oil demand that's really driving these oil seed prices at the moment. Last thing here, and you hinted at it earlier, and that is the world freight situation and freight charges. That scenario is improving now to the benefit of grain sellers? Well, I don't know if it's to the benefit of the grain sellers, definitely to the benefit of ship owners. We've seen that that market quite volatile over the last 12 months, reaching uh, 13-year highs. About five weeks ago, we saw that drop about in half, but still at historically high levels. And in the last week or so, we've seen that that market rally back up a bit. That ocean freight is a big component of value that our uh, importers uh, pay for. And I think that's one reason we're seeing a slow export pace across a number of commodities here in the U.S. uh, is because of that sort of significantly higher uh, cost of ocean freight. And that is but one of a slew of things that Guy regularly tracks in the international grain trades. And he does post regularly his observations on those trades, what's driving them on the agmanager.info website. Producers, we'd encourage you to have a look at what Guy has to say about these important markets. Guy, always a pleasure to hear your comments. Thanks for coming over. Thank you, Eric. Senior economist with the IGP Institute here at K-State, that's Guy Allen. Agriculture Today is back after this over the K-State Radio Network. We're back now on this Agriculture Today, and on this segment, we'll get you up to the moment on one aspect of international agricultural programs out of Kansas State University. Falls under the heading of the Feed the Future Innovation Laboratory for Collaborative Research on Sorghum and Millet. It's a mouthful, of course, but it's important work. And our guest will tell us what's happening within that program right now. He is Nat Bascom, Assistant Director of that laboratory. Nat, it does benefit one to explain what these Feed the Future laboratories are in a broad sense, and then we'll narrow it down to your specific work. Would you yeah. do so? Yeah, thanks, Eric. So, Within our federal government, we have the United States Agency for International Development, which does a lot of great work globally. Typically, we think of them as sort of development or relief work. But within that agency, we've had a longstanding funding for collaborative research, really support programs that um, over the last 30 to 40 years have been funded under USAID, which basically tries to leverage the great knowledge and and research and teaching that are housed in land-grant institutions around this country and build that into kind of a global initiative to work in some of these, work with really in partnership with these target countries where in the case of sorghum, which originates from Ethiopia and southern Sudan, and then pearl millet, which originates from West Africa, work um, with our partners over there to develop their research capacity over time. Also, really trying to build, again, this global network so that the crop and that value chain grows globally for the benefit of everybody. And then probably more importantly, we're really about trying to develop really specific, relevant technologies that apply for those smallholder farmers in those countries. And then I can also talk about just what we call the spillback benefits to our U.S. production. And we certainly would like to get into that, but it yeah. does dispel the image of a physical laboratory. It's right, a, yeah. yeah. It's kind that of confuses a, folks. Yeah, so. it's kind of a bad word, actually. We <laughs> we we took over this uh, initiative uh, about eight years ago, and previous to that, they were called collaborative research support programs, and that's a much better term. We work as a management entity right here at K-State. We funded about 15 research projects 
um, with global researchers, many of which are led by U.S. Uh, principal investigators. And yeah. we do want to get a taste of that research uh, yeah. that's been going on of late. But this laboratory yeah. is concentrating on two crops of yeah. international interest, sorghum yeah. and millet. Uh-huh. And why those two? Yeah, great question. So globally, you know, and particularly in West and East Africa and into India and Asia, we estimate about five or 600 million people depend on this sorghum and pearl millet as really uh, food security crop. So people in those contexts, is th- this is the food basket. Uh, we even estimate 70% of their caloric intake from cereal grains come from these two crops. So very much a, f- a part of the food system in those countries. And then I think more importantly, these are often two crops that are grown in very drought, heat, stressed areas. So you're on the edge of some of the most difficult areas to grow cereals and other crops. So you've got real economic poverty, a lot of populations that are very vulnerable, a lot of malnutrition. And so these are just key crops that help support those communities that are very vulnerable economically. And then your laboratory brings together expertise and skills to address the needs of those those potential international uh, consumers yeah. of those? Yeah. So when we started off, we worked really hard to uh, engage with the national teams in Senegal, Niger, Ethiopia, Haiti, around what we would call national prioritization, which is basically a listening session to the researchers, the private industry, uh, farmer associations, uh, women's uh, food processing entrepreneurs, just what did they want the research to look like and what was the de- the kinds of technology demand that they that they had and and document that so that when we started looking for research to push towards development and technology it's based truly on what the national teams uh have defined and articulated so it really is is it's uh based on that national perspective but then i think the beauty of it is just that you you, you leverage in this global A team. I mean, you, you're getting um, everything from from genomists, he, genomic uh, scientists here in the U.S. that are able to leverage some of those really emerging skills around mapping genomes and being able to identify traits in the in the different varieties, and then pairing that with very traditional breeding programs in those countries, so that the speed at which they can develop improved uh, varieties and and hybrids to react to their changing conditions is just that much quicker. So, um, and then there's there's also examples of that same global team around food products, around production systems as well. Hence the the phrase collaborative research in yeah. the title. Yeah, that's why it's there. Yeah. So up to the moment here, some of the more recent achievements in the program. Yeah. What would you highlight there, Nat? There's a lot of success stories there. Everything from Like we've had a a recent release of a kind of a disease-resistant sorghum for western Ethiopia, which is grown in in a higher rainfall area where anthracnose is a disease pressure. So we've been able, through the teams at Purdue and K-State, to identify those key genes that give anthracnose resistance, then pair that into ingressing that in a breeding situation into the sorghums that farmers already appreciate and want in Western uh, Ethiopia, and then actually getting that out to farmer associations. So that variety called Merara has just been released in Ethiopia in the last officially registered, and that has up to a 43% yield gain, which is Mm. off the chart, you know, in that context. So big news, and really that comes to bear where it's just actually adding value to the the food security of the various uh, smallholders, but it's really now providing production increase to where they can really sell that at market, and that translates into paying school fees or having more money in the pocket. So it's really up the production levels there in Western uh, Ethiopia. So that's kind of one technology, but there's others that have been brought to bear. We've got a seed ball technology using locally produced at the household level kind of golf ball seed balls that are made from a little bit of clay, some ash, organic matter, 
uh, you put about 10 pearl millet seeds in that, and then you, you actually plant that seed ball, and that provides a micro environment to help that seed establishment and plant life in the first two weeks of of emergence. And so we've seen up to 15% yield gains, and it also allows particularly women to plant those in the two weeks before the rains come so they can get more land planted before that intense period when you do a traditional planting when the rains are right right in season. Plenty of innovation happening here, hence the title. (laughs) It all fits together. You brought this up earlier. Yeah. We're coming back to it. Yeah. That there is a backflow yeah. to yeah. production agriculture in yeah. the U.S. Yeah. from these efforts abroad. Yeah. Yeah. How so? Well, great question. So Kansas, we're the number one sorghum producer in the United States. I think we're about 60% of the production. If we look at different pressures that we faced both in Kansas but also in Texas and Oklahoma, just one to mention is sugarcane aphid which kind of hit us about five to six years ago. Broadside. (laughs) Yeah, jumped from from sugarcane into uh, sorghum and then moved from the southern United States up to, I think, around Highway 36 northwise in Kansas. Well, we had yield losses big time and a lot of just issues in terms of harvesting because these sugarcane aphids would just clog up combines and that kind of thing. So we were able, through our international um, linkages with teams overseas, to find sorghum plant materials and and parental lines that had already seen sugarcane aphid, already built up resistance to that, be able to identify that quickly, and then be able to bring that into our U.S. breeding program to where we were able to much more quickly speed up the breeding program in the U.S. to come up with a sugarcane aphid resistance in our hybrid lines here. And we estimated something like two or three hundred million dollars of savings because of that. So the research has these huge spillback benefits to the U.S. uh, industry. And the knowledge is generated for all to use, including right here in the U.S. So Nat, what's next for the program as we're heading into a new year? Are there aspirations in particular or continuing what's going on currently? Yeah, this leveraging of the what we would call genomics-assisted breeding platforms that have been built up by using the skills, the resources, the knowledge, and the capacity in the U.S., pairing that with the national programs in these various countries, have set the scene for improved varieties and hybrids, not only in this next, say, one- to two-year period, but really into the next five- to ten-year horizon. Good luck with the new year and all of those endeavors, Nat. We appreciate the overview. Thanks for coming over. Thank you. Appreciate it. He is the assistant director of the Feed the Future Innovation Laboratory for Collaborative Research on Sorghum and Millet, based out of Kansas State University. Nat Bascom, you're listening to Agriculture Today. This is Agriculture Today. Stop, look, and listen. The acreage says more to me than the money. That's Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with comment on life in rural Kansas. A friend sent me the article from The Guardian that Mr. Murdoch has bought the 340,000 acres cattle ranch from the Koch family. The acreage says more to me than the money, which was paid for it. Apparently, 200 million exchanged hands. That much money is beyond me. But I find the acreage fascinating. Just imagine owning 340,000 acres with all the wildlife, deer and trout in the streams. The ranch is known as Beaverhead Ranch, so I assume there must be beavers. It's an interesting article to read, as its closeness to Yellowstone National Park gives an idea of the setting. Beautiful. I'm sure that the conservation practices will continue, as well as the commercial cattle business. I went to the computer and did some further clicking. Beautiful country. 
when fencing, I would look up and enjoy the scenery, the snow-capped mountains, and listen to the elk bull bugle. And for that matter, I don't expect Mr. Murdoch to drive many steel posts down or dig a deep hole for a stout corner post. If you can plunk 200 million down, I expect you have all the ranch work done, probably by contractors. And I think rightly so, because he has to keep an eye on the many other enterprises and make the capital. Of course, I expect he will climb in a four-wheeler and crisscross his property, all 340,000 acres. As I thought about the Beaverhead Ranch and about my own acreage, 430 acres of hilly Flint Hills land, I thought about the many quiet places I know on our land, where if I sit down, I see it all. I'm enclosed. I would be hard to find. I can walk into a draw and only look so far. I can step near a spring and watch the clear water come out of the hills. In the woods, I can look at the big oaks and wonder their age. As I walk the dry or nearly dry creek, I stop at the remaining water holes and see the small fish dart. I can sit down and listen to the geese flying over. Presently, there's a murder of crows. I see where the buck scrape this fall. There is so much to see, and if I'm down off the hills, that's all I can see. All the cattle are gone. We only do summer grazing. It's easy to drive the hay meadows and inspect the different ponds and see if there has been any new beaver activity. I like to know. I like to disturb the quail so I know they're there. Just like I watch the turkeys. It's only a small part of the Flint Hills, but I know the place like the children and some of the grandchildren do. They camp there and cut firewood and check the fence line. We know where we are. Once on top, on the high hills, we can look far. We can see sunrise and sunset and the waxing moon. It's the same sun and moon that shine over Beaverhead Ranch. The same nightfall when nightlife can be heard, the owl. The same starry night with that bright, very bright star out west. It's the planet Venus. It's all there. Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with his weekly commentary on life in rural Kansas. That's our time once more. Thanks to you for tuning in. Eric Atkinson for Agriculture Today. This is the K-State Radio Network.